your grace and your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Receive our worship as an I love you from us, and may we be encouraged, inspired, and instructed by your word this morning. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You will recognize the story in this song. The disciples were assembled in the upper room. They didn't know that Jesus would be leaving very soon. They talked about his kingdom as they ready for the feast. Who would be the greatest? Who would be the least? One said, if there's a greatest, I hope I'm the one. Others talked of miracles that they had seen or done. No one noticed Jesus as he rose up from his seat until he knelt before them and began to wash their feet. I've come to serve you. I've come to serve you. stand we're gonna sing um, mighty cross and uh, it's got some really deep notes in here so we need you men to really step up be good and loud for the, our deep notes Surrender to the mighty cross of 
All we're missing this week is Lana on the bongo. She did so good last week. Let's pray again. Father, we love you and we thank you for the day. Uh, be glorified and let us be instructed and encouraged in this hour. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While you're turning to John chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 41 through 71, which is 30 verses, but it's not gonna, we're not going to take all day to do it. Messaging is vitally important to communication and leadership. And I learned lessons in messaging from Chief David Brown when he was in command of the police department. 
Having encountered media for many, many years, I would be at a scene or involved in something and I would go home and listen to how they reported it and it was often very different than uh, what I experienced when I was there. And you've probably seen interviews um, where certain words were just picked out of the interview and something was very differently communicated than the intent of the person doing the talking. So David Brown was a little bit genius when it came to dealing with the media. He had a counter plan. Anytime he got interviewed by the media, he had his own media team there to record the entire conversation. So whatever got put on the news, uh, David Brown would rebroadcast the entire conversation on Facebook. And so it was impossible to take him out of context because he would provide his own context, which was actually a pretty good idea. And I watched and was instructed one day as he put, uh, as he was interviewed regarding the computers and the squad cars, and there were two conversations going on. Two, they were, they were in tandem, they were, they were going on together, like two people skydiving attached to each other. They were, they were, they were moving at the same pace, and they were side by side, but they weren't the same conversation. The conversation that the media wanted was, it's really wrong for officers to ever look at a computer screen because it's dangerous and they should quit doing that ever, ever, ever. David Brown's message was 90% of all police accidents happen while backing. That's really not a problem for us and they have to receive messages about the calls they're going to so it would be dangerous for them not to look at that. For 29 minutes, the media guy kept trying to make his narrative from every angle in every direction that he possibly could and David Brown just repeated the same statistic every time. Now in order to do that, you gotta know what you're talking about. You have to know what you're being faced with. You have to have confidence in what you're saying. You need to be right. And you need to have the steel within you not to be swayed by being attacked from several different angles. But I learned that day watching him um, of his skill and not allowing himself to be taken off task. Because every time they would say, but don't you think, yeah, but what about this, and, but, don't, but, don't, but don't you really think, and every time he just gave the same answer, because the answer was the same answer. And after 29 minutes of listening to it, I walked away going, well, you know, 90% of all police accidents are from backing, and I really don't think this is, and I mean, what? I repeated it, right? Because he kept repeating it. And so sometimes with messaging, there's the forest and the trees, right? And so this thing's going on with Jesus in these people because Jesus is here to say I'm life you need me to live and the people are following him saying we really enjoyed the buffet do it again and from now on and this conversation goes on for the entire chapter chapter 6 and it's almost exhausting except you just see this back and forth and back and forth and Jesus treats keeps trying to get them off of the physical and on to the spiritual, and they refuse. And finally, in the end, Jesus says, it's spiritual. And anybody that followed Jesus or listened to Jesus for the first two years of his ministry should know that he loves to speak in parables, right? He likes to give a physical story with a spiritual significance. And so it shouldn't be unusual to anybody that he would talk about flesh and blood and not mean flesh and blood that he would mean something spiritual, sustenance. These people, all they could think about is what they wanted physically, and Jesus says, I've got more for you. That should be obvious, except that when you just want what you want, and it feels like you're not getting given what you want, then things just get blurred. And so there's the overall message, and there are two messages going on from the crowds to Jesus, here's what we expect of you. From Jesus to the crowds, here's who I am and what I'm trying to do for you. This tandem message, and there's also the, the, verb, the verbiage that is getting totally lost and totally confused to the point that an entire denomination will teach that Jesus, you get Jesus' body in your mouth and you drink his blood literally, which is absolutely nothing of what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus said it's the opposite. This is a spiritual lesson. This alone should be enough to nix any idea of transubstantiation. He says this is a spiritual illustration. That should be the end of that. But it hasn't been. It hasn't been until this very day. And in churches all over the country, there are people that still misunderstand that because of this, because they got caught in the verbiage. Remember, 
Princess Bride, the 1980s. Do you like it? You don't like it. Joanne doesn't like it. I like it. So Princess Bride, okay, the classic 80s movie where the peasant falls in love with a girl, and then he gets captured by a pirate and becomes a pirate and learns how to you know, be a swashbuckler. And then the girl gets kidnapped, and she's going to be forced to be a queen. And so now the, the guy, the hero, tries to go rescue her before she's forced into being a queen. And while he's trying to get to her, he has various obstacles. And one obstacle is this little guy that tries to kill him every which way he can, but he can't. Tries to kill him with his giant, tries to kill him with his swashbuckler, tries to kill him with poison. It keeps not working. And every time he's unable to kill the hero, he says the same thing. Inconceivable. Inconceivable. And finally, Indigo Montoya looks at him and says, I don't think that word means what you think it means. And so we have a word problem because we have a focus problem. And we have a communication problem because we have a heart problem. And these people, first of all, they want to take Jesus and make him king by force. And if you didn't know this, and I'm, most of you do, Jesus was actually a son of David. He actually would have been a rightful heir to the throne. He was qualified to be king. But he had bigger plans than to be a physical king at that time. He had a bigger mission. And he even tries to tell these people in the midst of it, you guys, you want this thing that's going to supply you, it's going to sustain you until you die. What I'm trying to give you is something that's going to sustain you beyond your physical death into your eternal life. And he tells them. But they don't get it. And what you have in John 6, 41 through 71, is this back and forth, dialectic in where they don't get it, Jesus re-explains it, they don't get it, Jesus re-explains it, and you have three crystal clear little timeouts where you see them chafe, you see them frustrated, you see them, you know, ah, uh, and then Jesus comes back and says it again, just like what I told you about David Brown. He, you know, the, the, it starts with their confusion, he clarifies. They're frustrated, he clarifies. They don't get it. He clarifies. They leave. Except for the true disciples. Now, this can be a discouraging message because most people leave. But this is an encouraging message because 12, 11, were able to take that message to the entire world and plant the existing church. So while it's sad that so many walk away, and effectively later would cry crucify him, it is encouraging that the 11 that remained by the power of God were able to establish the New Testament church that lives today. 11 people started First Baptist Church in Dallas. 11. In somebody's living room. It doesn't look like a living room anymore. Okay? And so there are days of humble beginnings, but where God is... There's enough. There's enough power. There's enough influence. There's enough energy. There's enough. And so let's watch this dialectic. In verse 41 and 42, the Jews fell to believe the deity of Christ. This is so big. This is so big. And I'm all, we're going to talk about this for a minute. We'll make camp on it just for a minute. 41 and 42. So the Jews grumbled. You can just hear it, right? They grumble about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose, fathers and whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I've come down from heaven? They have two stumbling blocks. Okay, There are two problems they have with the narrative of Jesus. Problem number one is that he clearly claims to be God. That's problem number one. Problem number two is he's trying to tell them that the Messiah must be butchered. The first problem is obvious. We know you. We grew up with you. We saw you have to wash your feet. We saw you have, you know, hit your thumb with a, I don't know if Jesus ever made that mistake, but, you know, when you were doing carpenter stuff. We saw you work and struggle in physicality with wood and nails and things that, you know, lays and whatever, uh, planes and whatever a sharp, uh, carpenter uses. We know you. We know your parents. You know what we do with people that call themselves God today? 
we call for the sheriffs, we call for the police, and we have them taken, and someone talks to them for 24 to 72 hours and probably medicates them. That's what we do today. And they didn't feel any differently about it back then. And so it was challenging for them to hear Jesus say, I'm God. But let's just think about it for a minute. For you to have proper theology, you really have to have a proper anthropology. Okay? Theology, study of God. Anthropology, study of man. In your very being, in your very sense, you naturally know that there are things that aren't right about you. C.S. Lewis called it natural law. And in philosophy, in Christian philosophy, natural law is that which tells you that you've trespassed somebody else or somebody else has trespassed you. And it happens all the time, right? The old Rodney King thing, can't we all just get along? The answer simply is no. Because what happens is, I have an idea of what is not trespassing me. You have an idea of what's not trespassing you. But we step on each other, don't we? We do. It's impossible not to. And at some point, somebody's wrong. Because physically and logically, two people cannot, cannot occupy the exact same space at the exact same time, right? So we bump into each other. There is within us an innate understanding that all have sinned. And Romans 1 says that there's enough revelation from looking around us and even looking at the very physicality of our systems that make us breathe, eat, live. You go to sleep, your heart keeps beating. That there's a designer and that we answer to that designer. Romans 1 is very philosophical. It is also beautifully theological. It is also absolutely anthropological because it has everything to do with us. It is obvious to us that we have sin. And if there's a creator, we need to do something with that sin. The mystery that God has a son is beyond explanation. But it is. There are many things beyond explanation. It's beyond my explanation that I can't draw a state line, but she can paint everything and make it beautiful. It's beyond explanation for me that if you give me metal and tools, I'll tear stuff up, but Mike can make it work. So I visit Mike. He makes it work, and it always works right, because he's great at that. We have differing skills. It's beyond explanation that you can turn your microwave on, and you atoms speed up and heat up your food. Cell service is beyond explanation. I understand Alexander Graham Bell. I understand a wire and a cup on each side. But when you start talking about fiber optics and all those other wires and how one just picks out the other one, you're, you're beyond me. Many things are intellectually challenging. It doesn't make them any less true. And so the heart of the gospel is there is a God. And there's us. And we were created by God for Him. We were created by God to love Him, to walk with Him, to know Him. And if we were going to choose God and love God and walk with God then for it to be a real relationship, there had to be choice. Anybody ever work with robotics of any kind? Anybody? Okay, well, if you take a robot, you got computers. You could program your computer. You'd probably even talk Siri into telling you that she loves you. If you get Siri to tell you that she loves you, it's going to be all right, man. It's going to be all right. I got my media people back going, what? Are you going to just get a warm feeling in your heart? Not if you told her to tell you. What happens, at, what happens on your anniversary or whatever when, you're, when you maybe forgot something that you know, your wife has to remind you to do something for her or to say something for you? They're like, well, are you, you happy now? No, because I had to tell you. They want it to come of your own volition. They want it to be your idea, right? Well, God didn't make us as robots. God made us as free moral agents. And for us to be free moral agents, we had to write, have the ability to make a choice. And Adam made the wrong line. And he's your daddy. I'm sorry. We are all related. And there's this sense because of what he did that we keep doing it. We need to be forgiven and we need to be right with God. There are very noble and very loving people that are in the process of coming to Christ. And every good thing about you is a reflection of the goodness of God. 
James says that every good and perfect thing comes from above. And there's something called common grace. So if for, even for the person that hasn't said yes to Jesus yet, every good thing about you is actually a reflection of the holiness and the righteousness and the goodness that is in God. Now last week, Paulson said something interesting to me. And I wasn't sure if he was messing with me. And then I realized that he was sincere. And because Joanne and I argued about this on the way home. Now I won't say that my wife argues, but I will say she'd be a good litigator. She seems to thrive on it. Anyway, so we were on the way home talking about election and, you know, what else, predestination, all that stuff. And Larry, we were doing something last week. You know, I don't remember where we were or when, <clears throat> but he passed me on the back. He goes, you know, one of these days I'd like you to explain that to me, okay? I'm like, yeah, well, if I could do that, I would probably make a lot of money, right? Here's the bottom line. And Chris will say it. God chooses, and so do I. And the Bible teaches both. And here's what I believe. This just, this just my theory that if you're going to say yes, you're going to get the chance. Now, if someone wants to make the excuse, I don't feel God calling me, so I'm not going to respond. Let me just give you a little hint. If you know me, God's probably calling you. Because my entire life is leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my purpose. That's it. If you know me, you think my life is about shooting guns and buying guitars. That's a, that's a side note. And I enjoy doing those things. And I'm not good at playing guitar, but I like having them. I have interests, I have hobbies, I have things I enjoy doing, but my purpose is to see people get saved and to see them have liberty and victory in, the li in their lives. That is my purpose. And to move this church wherever God wants it to be from where it is right now. And that's with more people in it that have just met them. And we're doing that. Okay? We're doing that over time. And then the more people that join me in that mission, the more it'll happen. So jump on board. Some of y'all need to move down here from the Metro Place and get away from the city and come join us and do that. That's it. And God who loves you and who wants to know you is going to draw you to himself. I do believe that he brings us to life. And then we respond. I do believe that because the Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sin. It doesn't take away from your choice. And it doesn't take away. And so you've got to get back to Crizzle. This is what we were arguing about all the way home. I wasn't sure I was having lunch, or we'd already had lunch. I wasn't sure anyway. I wasn't sure I was going to have any peace. You know, she wasn't happy with my answer, and I said, the answer is what the Bible says. But you said, but the Bible says. But you said, and I'm going to just go back to the Bible, and I'll go back to Dr. Criswell, who says, there's God's words and our words. I'm going to let God handle his stuff, and I'm just going to handle my stuff. So if someone's going to live, if someone's going to know God, why not you? Why not you? Right? So um, if you're here, if you are... If you know me, uh, probably God is in the process of drawing you if you're not already there because there's a reason that we're, that we're doing stuff. There's a reason that you know us. There's a reason that, that there's a camaraderie there. God does call people to himself, and he calls churches, and he calls, he calls the people to be in a church. He calls a group together to serve together, to work together, to do things together. And there's pleasure in the family of God living and serving together. It's a pleasure. It is. It's a pleasure. And we enjoy that. So, you know, we really need to get to the scripture, don't we? Okay. They were failing to believe in the deity of Christ because they were caught up in this personage. They're caught up in it. They're like, how could this be? But they're failing to see beyond the obvious. If you've had any experience in this life, you've learned to see beyond the obvious. There's entire movies and series and books. What are they all written about? People being fooled because all they do is look at the obvious and they're simple-minded. They don't get beyond just what's in front of their face. But you know better than that. You're not simple-minded people. The people in this congregation right now are very accomplished people. You know better than that. So God seeks us out. God calls us. And Jesus is doing it right now. But the people that don't respond are those that are caught up in the flesh and they can't get beyond the obvious. They can't get beyond it. And so he responds to their unbelief. By repeating the essential message. Verses 43 through 51 is the essential message. Verse 47 being a key verse. So let's look at it. 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. Stop. You ever just hear someone murmuring, grumbling? They're just, blah, blah, blah. They're, just they're kind of in an attitude funk. And before they're going to get out of that wrong way of thinking, sometimes they just need to see a stop sign. Sometimes they need to see a stoplight. Sometimes they need to quit repeating the negativity and just reset their heads and their hearts so they can receive something 
You know, some people just can't receive anything because they've just got a bad attitude. Or they're angry, or they're frustrated, or they're just not happy for whatever reason. Jesus says, stop grumbling. Isn't that interesting? Stop grumbling. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's your election. There's your providence. But if you're here, I think he's drawing you if you're not already there. And I will raise him up in the last day. What's he saying? We're going to see this thing through. If I'm calling them, I'm going to save them. If I'm going to save them, I'm going to sanctify them. If I'm going to sanctify them, someday they're going to die and I'm going to glorify them. And we're going to see this all the way through. He that began a good work in you will finish it. Will finish it. Be faithful to finish it, to complete it. It is written in the prophets that they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. God calls. He does. It's called the effectual call of God. When you hear God's heart saying, I'm here. I'm real. I know you didn't get it before, but you're getting it now. Hear me. Come to me. It's called the effectual call of God. Now, I do believe the effectual call of God precedes regeneration, but that's a side note. Just respond. Just say yes. Just come to dinner. Don't worry about if you got an email or if you got a text or if you got a phone call. Or if you saw it on a banner plane, just come eat, okay? Just come eat. Just join us. Have steak with us, all right? Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who came from God. And I know the Bible talks about Moses talking to God like one man talks to another face by face, but it also says that God wouldn't let him see his face. He turned and just let him, let him see the glory of him so he wouldn't die. And so what he's saying is there's a, there's a sense in which no one has truly seen God in his pure righteous spiritual form or they would die because you have to be glorified before you can handle that okay but we've seen jesus he has seen he has seen the father speaking of himself and here here's a summary statement truly truly i say to you remember truly truly is a redirect whoever believes has eternal life i am the bread of life here's the message and this is key because you say, how do I know if I'm saved or not? If you are a pistuo, if you are trusting in, if you're believing on him, you have eternal life. You already have it. You have it. But there was a one point in time that you received it. When you confessed him as Lord, and when you chose to, to trust him, to, to faith upon him, pistuo, that was the point in time when it happened. And if you don't know the date, the time, the month, whatever, then you can pray and you can nail it down. You can do it. It's doable. But the essence of the message is this. I come that you have life. I'm the bread of life. Very simple business. In the same way that bread sustains you physically, you have to have me to be sustained spiritually. Simple business, easy illustration, not so hard. But to make it hard. Because the Bible says their foolish hearts were darkened, these people, these unbelievers. These guys here. These guys here. And so they dispute. Verse 52, they're still, they're just like, ah. Oh. And so he goes a little further with it. He says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna from the wilderness and they died. This is key. This manna that you say you want, all you want is the buffet. Your daddies ate it and they're dead. What do you think your outcome is going to be? This thing that you say, this is all I want, and they still died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. You see the contrast? It's the temporal versus the eternal. The temporal versus the eternal. And it will always be the tug and the struggle of your life that you will either be distracted by the temporal and you'll lean toward the temporal and you'll pull all your eggs in a temporal basket or you'll put your eggs in your faith and your focus and your energy in that which is eternal and you'll have an eternal reward for it. That contrast will always be there and that rivalry will always be there. Are you simply going to think of the tangible or will you think of that that goes beyond the eyes, the ears, the senses? This verse summarizes all of it. It is a summary right there. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, receive me. 
He will live forever, and the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here's the message. I came for you to give you life, and I'm fixing to have to give my body to accomplish that. That's the message. That's the gospel. That's the message. And that should make sense to us, because if someone has to pay for my sin, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Okay, Payday for sin is death. Okay, We've all sinned. We've all done it. Somebody's got to pay for it. Anybody here ever, ever, ever take a spanking for your sibling? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. We've got some courageous people here. All right. Really, Jim? We've got some courageous people here. That's, that's love, isn't it? I love you so much that I know someone's going to get a whooping. I'll take it. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. Because he was man, he could take our place. Because he was God, he could do it for everybody. And that is a very simple equation. He's deity, so he's infinite, so he can cover it all. He's, he became man so that he's like us, so that being of like kind, he could pay that price. That is the formula. The Jews weren't getting it. The Jews then disputed among themselves. Now they start arguing with each other, like the preacher and his wife on the way home about, you know, election or whatever. They're arguing among themselves. What? No, no, you didn't, no that's not what he said. That's not what I said. They're arguing. They're, they're getting into it with each other now. Now, these are the Jews. Notice this isn't the disciples now. These are the Jews. The Jews are the enemies of Christ. They're the ones that are henpecking him. They're the ones that are waiting for him to make a mistake so they can ambush him, bushwhack him, the Jews. But in a minute, you're going to see even the disciples struggle. Okay? So it's going from the outside to the inside. The Jews, of course, they don't get it. They're not even believers. But even the disciples are going to stumble in a moment. But right now, we're at the Jews. The Jews disputed among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? He's a weirdo. He's a vampire. He's, he's like, uh, what was it? When, what's, huh? Zombie. What was it when um, Angelina Jolene had that guy's blood around the neck, you know, all that weirdness? Anyway, it's like that. It's like Angelina Jolene. Back in the day. But anyway, all right. Long time ago. The Jews disputed among themselves. How can he give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus is listening. And so Jesus, for the second time, restates his premise. Here we go again. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, remember, every time truly, truly, it's a redirect. It's, you guys are missing it. Let me tell you what I'm trying to say here. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up in the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood abides in me, and I and him. He keeps saying the same thing over and over. Why? Because these cats are grumbling. Some of them don't hear what he said. So well, he says it again. And he says it again. And he says it again. I'm going to say this until you hear it. You're going to decide whether you believe it or not. You're going to decide if you understand it or not. But I'm going to keep saying this because this is the message. You guys want buffet. I want you to live forever. And so it continues on. And um, verse 58 is kind of... Uh, it's kind of a summary statement. <clears throat> 57, as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. And whoever feeds on me will also will live because of me. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers, um, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. He's telling you, different, different, get the picture here, different. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And so this message has moved all the way from the seaside to the synagogue. It started with a chase. Anybody ever been in a car chase? Didn't you tell me you ran from the police? She, she has. She ran from the police on a dirt bike. Braden's been in a chase. I've been in lots of chases back when we could be in them. They were a lot of fun. It started with a boat chase. They're trying to find Jesus. Where'd he go? We want more buffet. Ah, where is he? They're, they're chasing him. They're, they're trying to catch Jesus because they want breakfast. They had a real good dinner the night before, and they want breakfast. Let me tell you what Ryrie says. Ryrie says about this, Just as one eats and drinks in order to have physical life, so it is necessary to appropriate Christ in order to have eternal life. That's a simple message. He says, has eternal life, uh, i.e. already has it, and can count on it being um, raised. Yeah, the body being raised. Okay. I need glasses. That's bad. All right. And so here it is. Here it is again. And so now the disciples don't get it. 
Good Lord, first the Jews, you'd expect that. Now the disciples, and more than the twelve, because the twelve stay. But the other disciples, the ones that had been following him, listening to him, they were, you know, they joined the ministry team, they would log in on his, you know, on his website, and they had a, you know, a password and everything. These people were more than just, you know, they were following him. And they start getting all confused. And it says in verse 60, it says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? You ever have anybody respond like that to the truth of God? Joanna and I were playing a church, and uh, we had a teaching one night on hell. And we had people that, man, they were with us. I'm talking about two years, three years. They followed us, and they were like, oh, yeah, everything we preached. And I preached, you know, in a little bit of different way. You know, back in the 90s, I was avant-garde and did, you know, things like the new way. I don't know, whatever. We were a younger crowd, and we kind of did things a younger way. And um, we connected with them. But when we talked about hell, and we taught on hell, and we showed a video on hell, we had one lady get up and run out of the room. She ran, just about screaming. She couldn't handle the idea of the reality of hell. But I'm going to tell you something. There's no, there's no salvation without damnation. Both are true. Hell is real. It's a real consequence. And uh, we had another say, lady that her and her husband were both very attractive people. She goes, I just can't believe that God would take someone so beautiful and put them in hell. Well, listen, we need to be forgiven for our sins. We need to made, be made pure by the blood of Jesus to have a right relationship for God. The the provision's there. God doesn't want your husband to go to hell. The provision is there. Take the provision. Take the provision. These are our words. Repent, believe, change your mind that leads to a change of direction. I used to think that only really bad people went to hell and all the good people went to heaven. And then you understand that none are good. We need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us completely so that we're acceptable. Joanna talked about being dirty, working out in the yard. I, I'm in the yard every day. I know all about it. I, Joanne is not having me sit next to her and eat dinner until I take a shower. It's not happening. I'm not coming in after working in 100 degree heat for four hours and say, let's eat, sweetie. It's not happening because it's gross. And I've, I'm used to me. I know what me smells like, so I don't smell me anymore, right? I've got nose blindness to me, but she does not. She's like, that's repulsive. That doesn't go with chicken or steak or anything else. No. And we need to be cleaned up to be in the presence of God. And it doesn't mean that we've been out doing the worst things ever. It just means that we need to be cleaned up. We need to have that right relationship. We need to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to die for me. Um, I love you, God. I, I want you to be my father. I want to follow you. Thank you for calling me. Forgive me for my sins. Take me to heaven when I die. And you're the boss of my life. I want you to rule my life. And that's salvation, right? That's a confession. Change of mind at least to change of direction. And then the pastua, the believing upon. Like when you're, you have the, the, the vest on, you have the parachute, but you pull the cord, and then you, all of what you have is resting on all of that to keep you from hitting the ground. The ground is coming. Okay? Every one of us, and for some of us, it feels very far away. The longer we live, the less far away it feels, right? It's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop, okay? There's going to be a time when we're going to meet death. That's either going to be a sweet transition where we see Jesus face to face. As Lottie Moon, as she was dying, was bowing to people that she had known, people that she had led to Christ. She could see them. As Stephen cried out, I see the Son of Man at the right hand of God. As he saw Jesus, as he was being pelted by rocks, and he died, he died glorifyingly, he died gently, even though he died a painful death, he was giving dying grace, he could see Jesus, and he glorified God to the last moment. As Polycarp, who was burned alive, Polycarp was the, um, he was the apostle of John, the one that wrote this book. And Polycarp was the lead elder uh, in Ephesus, I believe it was, after John had, had uh, died. And he was so revered and so loved. And they had the, the tradition of worshiping Caesar. And a bust of Caesar would move throughout the city. And you were required to purchase incense, burn that incense, and say, 
Caesar Curios, Jesus, I'm sorry, Caesar's Lord. And Polycarp said, I refuse, I will not do it. They said, please, please, just do it. You know, we don't want to kill you. He says, no, I, I can't do that. And, and so they came to his house to arrest him. He fed them breakfast. He walked with them. He said, you don't have time to help. I'll go with you. They get to the stake. He says, you don't have time to help. I'll stand here. He stood there, and he had a, he had a signal that he gave to the Christians that dying for Jesus Christ was bearable. And as his body was aflame, he flashed the signal to the other Christians that dying grace in fact exists and dying for the Savior was a bearable sacrifice. We don't sacrifice much here, honestly. We don't. I, I'm talking to an African pastor right now on Facebook. The people that come to his church walk there. They walk there in African heat. He himself as a pastor has no car. I'm talking to some other people. We're thinking maybe there's some way we can maybe send him some money for a car. And he's like 4500 bucks. He doesn't even have a car. He's the pastor. The people walk to his church. Sometimes we can't get people to drive to church. We have air conditioning. His people are walking to church. Question for you today. And I could preach on for a long, long time, but we'll just stop there. Uh, is Jesus calling you today? Is God calling you? If God is calling you, if he showed you that he's real, if you've seen his reality in friends and family and us, it's a good day to say, you know what, I think I get it. I think I get it now. I think I understand that Jesus is God's son, that he is in fact God, that he died to pay for my sins so I could be right with God, and I, I want to do that, and I want him to, I want, Jesus, I believe you, God. Forgive me for my sin. Take me to heaven when I die and rule my life right now. If that's your heart, let us know. ChrisMarsh67 at gmail.com. If you're not in this room and you make that decision, let me know. We'll talk. And we'll start making our transition to our in-house invitation. Don't be confused by God's word.